what are those episodes? What are those uh, periods? Uh, I, I always like to look at uh, the history of Matebele and struggle uh, from 1894. I break it into five phases. Now, the first phase is the period between 1894 and the 1950s. And then the second phase is the period from the 1950s up to I would say 1982. I will explain why I break it down that way. And then the next one is the 1982 to 1987. That was a very brief period, but very full of activity. Very intense activity. Then from 1987 to 2005, we also come to, 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 to understand some changes there. And then the last phase, I would say, is 2005 and beyond. Now, having broken them down, let me just uh, summarize what I meant by phase one. From 1894 to, 18, to, to, to the 1950s, Matebele particularism remained. The people of Matebele Land continued to wage wars and struggles and uh, some, some of them were called rebellions. Uh, for instance, you recall that from 1895-96 thereabout, under the, 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 the tutelage or the command of Indovugazulo's K, there was Impi Yeshoga Elibomvu, what has been dubbed the, the, the Ndebele Uprising, Umfugela Wama Ndebele according to Ndabanini story. So, now, that was a continuation of, uh, you know, one would say the battles of Mbembezi and the battles of Pupu. So, we would say after those defeats, the Ndebele people just gave themselves a, a few months to regroup and reorganize. And when it seemed like uh, the circumstances were permissive, they then went on to relaunch the struggle against uh, uh, against the... Uh, the, the white settlers. So that continued well into uh, the 19, the period after 1900. Uh, as you can see later on, there were many other uh, uprisings, many other, you know, isolated incidents. Uh, as you will see, even the, the, the activities of such groups as the, the Material and Home Society trying to keep people together and, uh, you know, clandestinely pursuing those efforts for the restoration of the Ndebele king and so on. Because the Ndebele people continued to see themselves as a unique nation, very distinct distinct from everybody else within the context of, of Rhodesia. So they were pe persistently and consistently seeking their own king and the restoration of their king. So, but in the 1950s, there was then a, a breakaway from that kind of an approach where you begin to see wider cooperation between the people in Matavili and the people in Mashona land. And then uh, some people would talk about those as the glory days of uh, the Zimbabwean nationalism, if one could, 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 could say that. But again, you find that it did not last very long. It was from about 1957 with the formation of the City Youth League. Fast forward to about 1962, the formation of Zapu, and then 1963, the formation of, 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 of ZANU, which then sees people regrouping again on ethnic lines and uh, pursuing, you know, separate, if one would say, destinies. And then, but uh, because the, 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 the this Zapo and Zanu waged this, this, this struggle against uh, the colonial system, uh, you find that in the 1970s, the, the war intensified, pushing for a settlement in, in 1979 that was held at, Lan held at Lancaster House, leading to the, you know, creation of the Lancaster House Constitution which was implemented in Zimbabwe in 1980 and it ran its course until 2013 when it was eventually repealed and replaced by another one. So, so the period from 1950s up to 1982 thereabout 
it's a period of hope. Maybe people embrace the idea of a one Zimbabwe from Zambezi to Limpopo, from Ramakwebane to, you know, Mtare there, the Honde Valley and so on. So that was the idea of a one Zimbabwe. But 1982 to 1987, that was the period of Kukuraundi and massive exclusion of the Matebele people, where we have more than 20,000 people killed and many other thousands raped and maimed, you know, all those different uh, challenges that people went through. Then 1987 is the period of the unity uh, accord, whatever that means. And then from that unity uh, accord, you find that uh, there is an element of trying to cooperate. Of course, it's forced loyalty, but it runs from 1987 until about uh, one would say 1999 with the formation of the movement for democratic change and then there seems to be excitement people are excited one would say about the idea of one Zimbabwe and then but by 2005 the, the, the MDC the movement of democratic change begins to decline because once again the issues of ethnic division and ethnic differences begin to crop up. And then so you find that again people start questioning themselves whether the idea of a one Zimbabwe is indeed viable. So you find that the period after 2005, the MTC splits and when it does split, uh, you find Tsangrai leads one faction and then we have another one, uh, you know, coalescing under Professor Welshman Mume. And then that becomes, again, like I've said, a period where a lot of questions are asked. Meanwhile, within ZANU-PF around 2008, 2009, you find that uh, ZAPU pulls away from ZANU. So uh, the likes of Dumiso Tabengwa, the likes of uh, Tenjuele Sabe and others decide that uh, the marriage of convenience between Zapu and, and, and Zanu uh, undertaken in 1987 is not working, so they pull out. So Zapu officially pulls out of uh, Zanu and then once again Zapu reconstitutes itself into a, a political party and it begins now to, to contest elections and so on. So then, uh, coming back to uh, the first question, the my primary question that we are dealing with, did Matebeleland fight a wrong struggle? Did Matebeleland fight a wrong war? In the light of what has been highlighted, clearly, it looks like a Matebeleland struggle was not properly defined from 1960s, 1950s and the 1960s because there seemed to be uh, vacillating between wanting to be members of uh, the Zimbabwe as it is configured current, uh, currently but as you will see in the post-2005 period uh, we have a stronger voice now of calls for an independent uh, Matebele homeland. So that becomes the defining uh, uh, character of uh, 2005 and beyond. So we have this stronger voice now where people are saying the relationship or the, the, con the, the marriage of convenience between Mashonaland and Matebele land is not working. Uh, it is a partnership of a horse and a rider where Matebele land is perpetually a horse while Majonaland is a perpetual rider because we see people moving in from Majonaland occupying space in Matebele land, occupying, occupying mines, the mining uh, claims, taking over land in Yamaindrovu and other, uh, you know, areas. For, for instance, one would uh, readily see that uh, the fast track land reform program was actually used as a as a gimmick as a trick to 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 take to bring people from Mashona land into Matebele land. So while people from Mashona land were allocated land in Matebele land under the guise 
that uh, it was a national program. There was there were no allocations of land to Matebele people uh, in the in Mashona land uh, areas. So you can you can readily see that uh, the first track land reform was just a smoke screen for the consolidation of Mashona land stranglehold on Matebele land and to bring more of their people into Matebele land to take over territory, take over resources and everything else. So now maybe just to sum things up, um, the next question is, would be, uh, where does Matebele land go from here? 